can start. Hi, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this next panel discussion entitled New and Promising Complementary and Integrative Approaches. My name is Dr. Ashnev Gurney. I'm a psychiatrist at Brigham Women's Hospital and Associate Vice Chair for Wellness. This series of brief individual talks by renowned academic thought leaders and research pioneers will provide an overview of innovative and promising treatments for depression, which combine both complementary and integrative approaches. And after everyone has a chance to speak, we will have what will prove to be a stimulating panel discussion um, so that we can all contemplate the interconnections among these treatments and the opportunities, as well as the limitations in each area. First, we will be hearing from Dr. Franklin King, who will be speaking on psychedelic assisted therapy. Dr. Kang is a Massachusetts General Hospital-based psychiatrist and researcher who graduated from the MGHCL Fellowship in 2018. His clinical work is focused on both neuropsychiatric conditions as well as anxiety and traumatic stress disorders, and his research focus includes anxiety and depressive disorders occurring in the context of medical and neurological disease. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. King is involved in a collaborative care-focused research within the MGH Cardiac Psychiatry Research Program. He is also currently involved in developing a 20-patient study planned to commence enrollment in early 2020 to examine the specific neuroimaging correlates of psilocybin-assisted therapy in patients with major depressive disorder, which has been the first Harvard study involving psychedelics in over four years. Thank you, for, Dr. Dr. King. Go ahead. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna talk just briefly a little bit about uh, psychedelics specifically for depression. This is uh, my main area of uh, focus. Just uh, disclosures here, and sorry, let me move, minimize the banner so I can see the slide. So I own personal stock in Compass and Cybin, and I've also received compensation from Cybin. I'm a therapist supervisor on one of their clinical trials and from Vital, which is a psychedelic education company um, as a teacher. So first, what do psychedelics do? So psychedelics don't have a universally accepted definition, but this is mine. Uh, psychedelics, first and foremost, are that which elicit a profound change in consciousness. This is often experienced uh, by the partaker as something of deeply personal or spiritual meaning. There's also this concept of ego dissolution, which is a little bit uh, sort of a thorny uh, thing to get into definition-wise, but it refers to the dissolution of the felt sense of the self as a discrete entity or the dissolution of the difference between subject and object. This usually is co-occurred with an experience of increased connectedness. It can be an element in sort of the so-called challenging experience. It can be fear-inducing. And finally, psychedelics produce an enrichment of the phenomenal experience generally, primarily and particularly visual. So people will have a heightened visual imagery. Um, they may see things that technically are hallucinations, but I want to be careful to not call them psychotic hallucinations. This is not a mimic of psychosis, and this is not an experience that is comparable to something like hyperactive delirium, which is the way sometimes I've seen psychedelics portrayed in sort of lay culture or in the media. Finally, psychedelics tend to leave a, a long imprint, both clinically and non-clinically. People report that these are deeply meaningful experiences years after, after having them. And I think that is the element that makes them so exciting for potential clinical applications. All right, so what are we talking about with psychedelics? I'm not talking about ketamine uh, in this particular talk, although it shares some of these elements. I'm really talking about the so-called classical psychedelics, which are the tryptamines shown here and the phenethylamines, the other big group. So the tryptamines are the heavyweights in current research. They include psilocybin, which is found in a variety of different mushrooms. They also include LSD, DMT, and 5-MeO-DMT. They all share within them the structural backbone of serotonin, which is a tryptamine. It's 5-hydroxytryptamine. You're seeing three different images of the LSD molecule there and serotonin sort of embedded within that. The second major group of the phenethylamines, this is a huge class that's used in pretty much every branch of medicine for different purposes. It also includes neurotransmitters, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. But there are a number of phenethylamines that are psychedelic. 
there were more researched actually other than MDMA a long time ago in the first wave of research back in the 50s and 60s when there was work done on mescaline, which is a phenethylamine. In contemporary research, really almost all of the studies have been conducted on MDMA. So this is sort of a large untapped reservoir of potential agents to study in the future. In terms of safety and physiological effects, Psychedelics are, are pretty safe. They're medically very well tolerated. Less than half of participants across different studies will experience headache, nausea, or fatigue, sometimes dizziness. These are time limited. They're not generally a major thing that is an adverse uh, experience uh, during the psychedelic session. They do reliably increase vital sign parameters. So these also are statistically, but generally not clinically significant. We're talking about about 10 millimeters of mercury increase in blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. Slight increase in heart rate, 10 to 20 beats per minute. Very slight increase in temperature, like less than one degree Celsius. For most people, this is not going to be clinically significant, but except for those potentially who can't tolerate these increases, such as someone with something like structural heart disease. People will have dilated pupils and increased reflexes uh, if you test them. But by and large, they have so far been very well tolerated, including in medically ill subjects. So it's so a great deal of research that was done in the 60s and some done recently that I'll refer to in a few slides in medically ill subjects, people with a high metastatic cancer burden, geriatric patients, and they seem to be medically safe. To the point where we actually don't have an LD50, that's the dose that is expected to kill 50% of someone who takes it, established for humans for either LSD or psilocybin. It's thought that probably that will be in either grams or kilograms which is a substantial quantity considering the fact that doses of LSD are in micrograms. Psilocybin is a 25 milligram dose. Finally, there's no evidence for mutagenic effects, neurotoxicity or cancer, including in high dose exposure. So this is the subject of a lot of propaganda campaigns in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and that's not actually evidence-based. So tachyphylaxis is something that reliably occurs with psychedelics. That means that you can't get a psychedelic effect after a few days of daily administration, even if you take more and more. There's cross tolerance between different agents. So for example, if someone took LSD three days in a row and then took psilocybin, they're probably not going to get an effect. It's likely correlates with down regulation of the 5-HT2A receptor. It's the subtype of serotonin receptor by which psychedelics work. It hasn't been shown in humans. It has been shown in animals. But this is significant because it means the biological dependence on psychedelics actually isn't possible. It's not possible to get addicted to these things, and it's not something that we see. Psychological safety, however, is more of a consideration than medical safety. So there can be a variety of challenging experiences that people can encounter under the influence of a psychedelic, ranging from anxiety up to paranoia. They can occur across a variety of different modalities, which I've listed here. Importantly, though, in clinical settings, the primary intervention is interpersonal support. The therapy is engaged to get the person through this and to sort of help them make meaning out of whatever it is that they're experiencing, really whether it's good or bad. So this is not the kind of situation where if somebody's feeling anxious that someone would jump in and give a benzo or an antipsychotic to terminate this experience. There is some screening that's done in any psychedelic study. So people who have a personal history of a psychotic episode, usually of, of, a, of a manic episode or, or type one bipolar disorder are screened out of these studies as are in many research protocols, people who have a primary family history of psychosis or mania. HPPD stands for hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder. It's essentially the clinical term for flashbacks or sort of persisting perceptual disturbances or changes um, that are unpleasant or result in dysfunction for the person after psychedelics. There's a lot of reports in the literature going back many years for people experiencing this after recreational use, but curiously, it's never been seen in any modern clinical trial, even after uh, thousands of patients have been uh, enrolled in different studies here. So not clear why that is, if it's simply the result of screening or something more related to the efficacy of the therapy. All right, so how are these things used? So psychedelics are not just used by themselves. They're always used as part of a specific therapy structure called psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. The therapist is present in the room at all times. Usually this is done with a therapist dyad, two therapists, one patient. There's a number of preparation sessions, which essentially get the person ready to enter into the psychedelic session with an attitude of openness and curiosity, to not sort of impose any, uh, any sort of expectation, to not come into the psychedelic experience, thinking that they're going to be able to, it, to control it. That's how people can get in trouble and encounter challenging experiences, but really just to sort of be open and explore whatever material comes up. 
This is really different than the way a lot of people might have used psychedelics recreationally with what's called an external experience of looking at things or interacting with the world. On, on the contrary, the paradigm in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is really to facilitate an internal experience. The person is asked to have an internal journey. They're given eye shades, they're given headphones with music and really encouraged to spend as much of the actual psychedelic session inside which means just sort of experiencing whatever comes up. Following the psychedelic session or sessions, there will be a number of therapy sessions called integration sessions. And that's where sort of more classic therapy happens, where the participant will sort of explore and discuss what came up for them. But the therapist role, again, is not there to sort of interpret or tell the patient what, what this means or what to do. It's just to facilitate the person to sort of make meaning of what happened on their own. Set and setting is super important. The environment matters. This is a particularly nice room, but this is not the kind of thing that can be done in sort of a standard sterile clinical environment. There's a lot of attention paid to making the environment nice. Um, and so this is sort of one of the challenges, I think, uh, for when these enter into, uh, into medicalization. So I'm just going to show you a few of the studies. Uh, you'll notice that the numbers on these are actually quite small, right? So there's so much interest in psychedelics. The actual evidence that we have is based on really small studies here. So you really have to sort of take a lot of the hype with a grain of salt. So this first study was a Robin Carr at Harris study. It was conducted in 2018, open label. So really hard to derive too much conclusions for this. I don't have a, an image of the data from this, but basically they treated 20 people with psilocybin, two sessions and found a really substantial and sustained reduction in their depression scores that lasted up to six months after the trial. These findings were replicated in a more controlled uh, study, a randomized controlled trial um, that was conducted by Johns Hopkins, published in 2020, enrolled 27 participants who had severe depression. And at the eight week mark, that was the primary endpoint of the study, slightly more than half had remission of their depression. Interestingly, in December last year, they published a 12-month follow-up of this study and found that those benefits were sustained. So again, you see this durability of change over time, and you can see on the upper right here, that's the study that I'm talking about. In 2021, this was New England Journal of Medicine paper published with almost 60 participants. This was an interesting study and remains the only one where they compared people given an SSRI and antidepressant as compared to two psilocybin sessions. And what they found at the primary endpoint is that both groups responded. So you had the group that was given s citalopram had a fairly good response, as did the group that were given uh, two sessions of psilocybin therapy. So there was not a statistical separation between these two groups on the primary outcome. Again, in this case, it was the quids. Worth mentioning a number of secondary measures, including the Hamilton and some other scores of depression and well-being, all actually were significantly better in the psilocybin group, but that wasn't their primary outpoint, uh, outcome. This study is hot off the presses. This came out about a week ago, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is the COMPASS study. This is phase two. This is the largest clinical trial to date studying any psychedelic, and they enrolled people into three arms. I think it was a total of 233 participants. 25 milligrams psilocybin, that's a normal dose. 10 milligrams is sort of a small, moderate dose, and then placebo. Found a substantial difference in reduction in depression symptoms in the group that was given the full dose. But what you can see over here on the right is that there was also a significant difference in the number of adverse events, including suicidal ideation and self injury. All right, so not a really great safety profile for this. So I have a lot of opinions on sort of how they conducted this, um, but really this sort of demonstrates, I think, some of the risks that are implicit in this work. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this one completely, but this is another area, the depression that occurs in the face of serious medical illness and terminal cancer. This is another really promising area of research, and there were a pair of studies with incredibly promising results published in 2016, looking at end-of-life associated anxiety and depression. Lastly, I just want to wrap up with the challenges of which there are many to this. Number one is scale and cost, right? So I mentioned two study therapists and all of these protocols, a number of preparation therapy sessions. The psychedelic sessions are long. These things last six to eight hours. And then there's integration therapy that occurs after. This is a lot of therapist time up front, and we don't know how this is going to be paid for, who's going to pay for it, and who's actually going to access this. So there's serious questions of equity when this actually hits the market, which is probably going to happen in a couple of years. Secondly, ethical issues of which there are also a number, right? So psychedelic therapy pulls a lot from indigenous cultures and indigenous practices. 
And yet these are the very practices that when they are used in indigenous populations continue to be criminalized, including in North and South America. So there's issues of epistemic injustice, there's issues of biopiracy, there's issues of what the field may owe to this group. And then finally, more broadly, I think competing medical philosophies. So this is quite different from really our typical medical model. Psychedelic therapy itself is non-prescriptive. Psychedelic, I think, is more akin to something like a practice-based modality, something like mindfulness than as a treatment per se. And then finally, this idea of the mystical experience, which is a critical element. So the people that actually have a complete mystical experience are the people that benefit the most in all of these studies. And how do we understand what that is in a sort of more objectivist medical paradigm? So some deeper philosophical challenges to understanding how these treatments work and how we can implement them um, remain to be seen. And with that, I will conclude and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. King. And now we will transition to having Dr. Cassano speak for us. Um, so he will be talking on photobiomodulation and infrared light therapies. Dr. Paolo Cassano is an assistant professor in psychiatry at Harvard University and director of photobiomodulation at the Massachusetts General Hospital Division of Neuropsychiatry and at the MG Depression Clinical and Research Program. Dr. Cassano has served as principal investigator on multiple studies on transcranial photobiomodulation for several neuropsychiatric disorders, such as major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. Dr. Cassano's research on transcranial photobiomodulation was funded by the National Institute for Mental Health, by the National Institute of Aging, by numerous nonprofit foundations, such as the Alzheimer's Association, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, the Down Syndrome Research Foundation, and the Milk Institute. Thank you, Dr. Cassano. Thank you, Asha, for the kind introduction. So the title of my presentation is Wearable Sunlight on the Skin, Infrared Light for Depression. Um, thank you so much also for inviting me today. So wearable sunlight, it sounds like a dream. Uh, however, it's something that we can make happen. So getting sunlight uh, on the skin. Um, I'm just going ahead here and presenting my disclosures and none of this is pertinent to, to the content of this presentation. So I'm going to start by presenting a picture of the Amazon forest. Uh, of course, we know plants, uh, take energy and derive energy through a photosynthetic process from sunlight. Well, it so happened that humans and animals can do the same. We have our own photosynthetic processes and we can derive energy then. So obviously, uh, as we all know, um, sunlight uh, strikes uh, to the equators and where the Amazon forest is uh, uh, more so than uh, towards the poles. Um, however, we can, through devices, uh, find ways to um, concentrate and deliver light sufficiently to have, hopefully, therapeutic effects. Now, when we think about sunlight, uh, of course, uh, uh, we know there are uh, the high energy wavelengths, uh, the UV, that can be mutagenic, can also induce uh, cancer. Um, however, that's not what we are referring to here in terms of potential treatments. And also we are familiar with use of visible light like bright light that we're using for um, seasonal affective disorder, for instance, in terms of treatment. Um, so that's an established way of using light. What we're going to talk about today is the light that is below the visible, the one that you see here to the far right, which is the infrared light. And the infrared light has both uh, the classic uh, um, thermal waves, and that's not what we are interested in here, and a portion of the infrared light that is very close to the visible, which we call near infrared light. So what about this near infrared light? When we shed near infrared light to, to uh, the forehead and to the head, it penetrates the skin, it penetrates uh, the bone, the, the meningeal layers up to the brain, and eventually penetrates uh, through the cell wall that here is represented in this picture, and, and hits 
deep into the cell, the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell where energy is produced for the cell. And that's where the energy transfer occurs and energized molecules are available. And also a chain of uh, uh, second messengers and uh, reactions within uh, the cell occur, which are beneficial. And you could say that the cells and the neurons are awakened um, by the light. So coincidentally, um, these mitochondria are affected in depression. We know that the mitochondrial DNA are affected and damaged. The permeability of the membrane is changed. The electron transport chain is altered, and which means that the cells are less viable. Um, so there is cell death. Um, oftentimes, there is higher inflammation and depression as a result of that. Uh, there is decreased plasticity, decreased connectivity in between cells. And also, we know that antidepressant treatment can um, restore some of the normal function. So now you have uh, a, uh, an intervention that specifically target uh, uh, an area and uh, um, some uh, organelles in the cells that we know to be dysfunctional in depression. So it is a great opportunity for a potential new treatment. So what we did at MGH and NYU, we have uh, looked at this opportunity and in a cohort of depressed patients, we look at whether neonfrared light could engage cerebral blood flow as a proxy of metabolism and brain function. Why? Because uh, um, there is a mechanism um, called neurovascular coupling. So then when the neurons are engaged and metabolic demands go up, then also cerebral blood flow adjusts to um, lead to the necessary supplies. So here you see on the left, um, what it looks like, this artificial sunlight uh, over the forehead um, and uh, these glamorous sunglasses uh, very much uh, in line with the topic of our conversation today. So what we did, we looked at uh, sham treatment, we looked at low, medium, high dose uh, on a weekly basis on the same participant within scanner and we measured blood flow before and after shedding the light. So first of all, we look at sham. And we we're glad to see that sham had no difference, no effect whatsoever on blood flow. And that's what we expected. Then we looked at a high dose, which we expected would be the highest, most effective dose. And um, what we saw that there was no effect whatsoever, much to, to our dismay. So that was puzzling. Then we look at the low dose that we thought would be subtherapeutic, too little light to penetrate and have an effect. But we tried again. And again, surprisingly, we saw that there was an effect, but was um, in the opposite direction, rather reducing the blood flow. You ultimately look at the medium dose, and there we saw an increase in cerebral blood flow. So, to make this story short, uh, we have run several clinical trials uh, in depressed patients. And we looked uh, at, of course, a clinical outcome, antidepressant effect and tolerability. And we had mixed results. While this treatment is very well tolerated, the effects were mixed. And just looking at this picture here, um, you can imagine that uh, different doses uh, might not have clinical benefits if they don't engage at all uh, brain function. With that, uh, I want to uh, use the last minute of my presentation to kind of flip a little bit to the topic here. I'll stay in topic, but I'm thinking we have different expertise here and I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, how my path across the path of other speakers today, and whether there could be any overlap in these different types of complementary and integrative medicine interventions. I'll start with Marin. Uh, Marin and I worked together for several years in the depression program, and Marin is very interested in 
uh, temperature control and the effect of uh, hyperthermia in depression. I can tell you that uh, from my perspective, that photobiomodulation definitely enhances uh, temperature at a skin level. However, our study, when it, we looked at brain temperature, showed uh, no increase in brain temperature, if anything, slight decrease, but not, not any different uh, than uh, uh, sham. Also, um, thinking about uh, uh, Franklin and um, his topic uh, over uh, psychedelic in medicine, he talked about uh, psychedelics as affecting either serotonergic or glutamatergic system. Here, interestingly, in animal models, it was shown that uh, um, photobiomodulation could affect uh, glutamatergic system. For instance, here, these dots represent in the synaptic uh, space uh, glutamate, which in the stress animal is excessively released, but is then is normalized by light. So also for the amber receptor, which are the beneficial receptor for the glutamatergic, they are decreased in stress animal normalized after the light. And the same is true for uh, the glutamate transporter. So interesting overlap. Uh, um, and uh, Franklin and I worked for a few years together in the anxiety program as well. And this is about uh, uh, photobiomodulation and interventional psychiatry, which is overlapping with uh, the talk that uh, Sean will give uh, today. And uh, um, Sean and I actually were just recently at a meeting where we discuss about uh, collaboration. Uh, interestingly, um, when you look at uh, uh, the possibility of uh, including uh, electrical stimulation and light stimulation, we made modeling about how we could put electrodes on the forehead and the light sources. We also model the effect of the, um, those positioning on electrical fields and the effect on intensity of light shed to for instance, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, showing that this is possible. And it's certainly a possibility in terms of cooperation and collaboration. Uh, finally, Sabine, uh, this is not just a blank slide. Uh, uh, Sabine and I are part of the uh, digital psychiatry um, uh, network at MGH, a think tank. She's directing that. And on my side, in terms of photobiomodulation, there's much interest in thinking how we can uh, inform the, the machines and the devices that shed the light with uh, digital information that comes from sensors, so sensors that uh, um, relate uh, information from functional biomarker of uh, uh, brain function. And those biomarkers can be validated uh, through uh, digital uh, markers, either from passive measures of behavior or active measures uh, of uh, uh, psychometric uh, importance so that uh, those sensors are validated for their importance. And then uh, curves of the uh, changes in those uh, functional uh, biomarkers can be traced, uh, for instance, here in red after treatment uh, compared to blue before treatment, uh, and the various intensity of stimuli, here are the red arrows of light, uh, can be tried to find out what's best to change uh, the specific functional biomarker. So in Thank some you, Dr. Cassano. So we're going to end there and move forward to talking about transcranial magnetic stimulation, which you led us up to. So thank, thank you for you. that. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sean Siddiqui. Um, Dr. Siddiqui is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, a neuropsychiatrist at Brigham Women's Hospital, and director of psychiatric neuromodulation research for the Center for Brain Circuit Therapeutics. Dr. Siddiqui's research is focused on causal mapping of human brain function and dysfunction. Using techniques such as functional connectivity MRI, Dr. Siddiqui maps brain circuits to link brain lesions and brain stimulation sites that can modify different psychiatric symptoms. These circuits can then be targeted with treatments such as transcranial magnetic stimulation and deep brain stimulation to alleviate symptoms in psychiatric disorders. 
His work has been recognized with multiple awards from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, the American Neuropsychiatric Association, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, Harvard Medical School, and many others. And I would like to just say that I've actually read a lot of his research myself, which has been so helpful um, in my care of patients at the front line. So thank you, Dr. Siddiqui, for being here and take it away. Well, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. And so I'm going to say again, I'm here to talk a little bit about clinical innovations in something that we call transcranial magnetic stimulation. I'll tell you guys what that means in a second. Uh, quickly, here's my disclosures where all the funding comes from. Uh, by far, my biggest Disclosure is that most of my funding comes from the NIMH, so I'm biased in favor of circuit-based dimensional models of mental illness. Um, I usually start with a quick acknowledgement. This is going to be a really funny joke, but we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to move on. But just, just trust me, you were going to laugh. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about exactly what transcranial magnetic stimulation is. So this thing we call TMS. So it uses electromagnetic induction to activate specific parts of the brain. You guys might remember learning in physics class that magnets can activate electricity. You might remember learning in biology class that electricity sends signals in the brain. And so we bring all these things together to modify signals in the brain. And these effects are believed to propagate to related brain regions. So for example, this is what our rig looks like. You can stimulate a specific spot, and then it activates neurons that are distributed across different parts of the brain. A clinical TMS protocol can then actually induce long-lasting changes. Uh, traditionally, this requires about 30 treatments over six weeks, but we're getting this faster and faster. And I'll tell you guys about that a little bit later. Uh, and in that, con in that vein, I want to talk a little bit about a brief history of brain circuit therapeutics, specifically for depression, but this applies to a lot of other mental illnesses also. Uh, I'd like to start with 1937, when James Papes described a brain circuit for emotion, which we now call the limbic system. Uh, some might say that the history of this field started a thousand years earlier with the medieval physician Ibn Sina, who described the idea that different brain regions can be involved in different mental illnesses or even a thousand years before that, when the Greek physician Galen found that different uh, brain regions do different things and damage can actually affect behavior. But I'm going to start with 1937 because that's easier. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, Jeffrey Knight in the UK and Thomas Valentine at Mass General started actually disrupting the circuit neurosurgically. They would go in and burn a hole in specific parts of the circuit so, uh, to see if we can potentially modify uh, behavior. And it actually was an effective treatment for depression. Uh, and then about uh, in the subsequent decade, Robert Robinson in Iowa found that lesions to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DLPFC, can actually cause depression. So I'll say that again, lesions to the limbic system can treat depression, lesions to the prefrontal cortex can cause depression. And subsequent neuroimaging studies found the same thing. Uh, depression was associated with decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex and increased activity in the limbic system. So in the 1990s, a group of neurologists and neuropsychiatrists at the NIH started treating depression using TMS to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The idea being if breaking it causes depression, if depressed people are underactive in this area, then let's stimulate it to treat depression. It turns out that it works. Uh, and about 10, and so what do we do this in the clinic? I often discourage people from thinking about TMS as a treatment per se. It's rather a tool that's often used to deliver treatment. I often liken it to psychiatric laparoscopy. You could, in theory, use it to, tr to target anything in the brain for, for any symptom. Um, at this point, different TMS targets and coils are FDA cleared for major depressive episodes since 2008, migraine with aura since 2013, obsessive compulsive disorder since 2018, and nicotine use disorder since uh, most recently in 2020. And we I also discourage people from thinking of TMS as ECT light. Uh, TMS is not similar to ECT. There are a lot of differences. The only thing they have in common is they're both procedural treatments for depression. Uh, but they have different potential clinical applications. TMS also works, like I said, for OCD and nicotine use disorder, whereas ECT we sometimes use for mania and schizophrenia. Uh, but depression is really the only thing that's in common right now. The mechanisms of action are probably different. TMS is targeted, whereas ECT is diffuse. And the tolerability and feasibility is different. So I often tell my trainees that if I am admitted to your inpatient unit with severe suicidal depression, I would want ECT, give me the most effective treatment we have. But in any other circumstance, I would rather have TMS because with TMS, it's easy to tolerate. There's no anesthesia. There are no cognitive side effects or confusion like we have with ECT. So you can walk in, get a treatment, drive back home or drive back to work and, and go on with your day. Uh, and then patterns and predictors of response can also be different. The question is, does it actually work, right? Does it actually tell us something useful? Or can we actually make our patients better? So in the real world, there are some important questions that we ask about TMS, like, is it covered by insurance? Well, yes, most of the time, 
uh, if the patients failed at least four antidepressants, uh, it's usually covered. If it's, it, and now that's getting down to, in Massachusetts, most of the time they'll even cover it with two antidepressants and in other states that that's expanding further and further. And any psychiatrist can tell you we have a lot of these patients. Next question is, is it safe? People worry about the seizure risk with TMS. The seizure risk is actually lower than it is with Wellbutrin, which is a common medication that we prescribe uh, without any further monitoring. Uh, and the headache risk is lower than it is with Prozac, which is another common medication that we prescribe. In general, TMS is quite well tolerated and quite safe. Um, is it effective? Uh, it's actually much more effective than trying another medication. For somebody who's failed multiple medications, uh, if you failed at least three antidepressant medications, the chance of responding to the fourth one is less than 20%, probably around 10%. For the same patient, the chance of responding to TMS is about 50 to 70%. So it's actually quite, quite effective. Uh, the next question, is it expensive? Well, it, it is expensive, but it's similar to the cost of about two years of Abilify as an adjunct, which is, which is less effective. Uh, the, most, the most difficult thing for people in terms of feasibility with TMS is usually the parking. Most common reason for people to tell me they don't want to get TMS is because they don't want to deal with parking in Boston. Uh, and then uh, which patients are most appropriate then becomes the million dollar question. Who should we send for this treatment beyond just anybody with major depression? So this becomes a question of what is next in this field? What are we trying to figure out next? So I'll tell you a little bit about what's on the horizon. I won't get into the technical details, but the most recent FDA clearance we've seen for TMS was just two months ago, September, 2022, when they uh, cleared a novel rapid acting TMS system for dreamer resistant depression. I've disclosed my conflict of interest. I, I consult for the company that, that makes this system. Um, there were two key optimizations here. Number one was the dosing pattern. Rather than giving these treatments over the course of a month, they took all the treatments we would normally give in a month and they gave them in a day. Uh, and then they did it again on day two and day three and day four and day five. And the remission rates we were seeing in a month, we were now seeing in one day. Uh, and then again, day two and day three and day four and day five. So it was, it was quite effective uh, and, and quite rapid. We'd never seen such rapid remission for major depression in psychiatry. This has since been replicated in a, in a clinical trial. Um, they also incorporated personalized image guided targeting for depression. So the important thing is this is for depression. Uh, it works for depression, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. If we can target the right circuit for depression, we should be able to do it for other things too. Uh, here's the kinds of results they were getting. On uh, a patient would start out quite depressed. This is the uh, remission criterion. Uh, by day three, most people were in remission. By day five, almost everybody was in remission. Again, and th this was sustained for at least five weeks. Now they've done subsequent studies up to six months or even 12 months and found that it's sustained. Now, I told you part of this was dosing. Another part of it is targeting. So we, we, we looked at uh, the targeting part specifically. We know that uh, the optimal targeting strategy is based on connectivity to a brain region called the subgenual cingulate, which we believe to be involved in depression. We stimulate a circuit that's connected to it. Uh, so we can, everybody has that in a slightly different place because we're all different. My brain connectivity is different from your brain connectivity. Uh, and so we can map that in each person and say, oh, look, here's your personalized target, that little blue spot. And we compare it to somebody's actual target, which is the black spot, look at the distance, and we find the closer the patient's optimal target was to their actual target, the better they do. So, that, to the, this, uh, so this really gives us the ability to personalize treatments to individual people. Uh, we, th this is, we've shown this in our lab. This has been shown independently using the in same sample size with the same effect size by an independent group in Australia, uh, and now also potentially by an independent group in Canada, which is not yet published. So I think th th that we're pretty convinced that this is real. So this suggests that we can map treatment targets. Uh, we've done it for depression, but we, we can also follow the same model uh, and, and apply it to other disorders. And I'm not going to get into the details of how, of the methods, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. But if we take the same path that it, that we use to find treatment targets for depression over the last 30 years and apply them to other disorders, we find treatment targets for all sorts of things, from mania to nicotine use disorder, to alcohol, to aggression, to depression, to PTSD, to, uh, uh, to uh, OCD. Uh, and we find the targets are slightly, the optimal targets are slightly different from each other based on these brain mapping techniques that we use to try to, uh, to find them in a causal manner. This is just a quick little sampling We've actually, uh, uh, the, the literature has quickly exploded into a much uh, uh, broader range of potential targets. So that's what's on the horizon. Uh, we're hoping that we'll start to be able to use this approach to treat, uh, hopefully, a wide range of mental illnesses very effectively, not just depression. Uh, but I would love to take any questions, and I think we're, we're going to have a discussion panel at the end to talk more about that. I'm happy to answer, to talk about the technical details or the clinical applications, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. So for now, we're going to transition 
to the topic of whole body hyperthermia and hot yoga. And I'm gonna invite Dr. Marin Nair up to the stage here to speak. Dr. Nair is the Director of Yoga Studies and the Associate Director of the Research Coordinator Program at the Depression Clinical Research Program at the Chusas General Hospital. She's an Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And her research interests include the treatment of mood disorders and associated symptoms, specifically developing and evaluating innovative and complementary integrative treatments for depression. She completed her pre-doctoral psychology internship at MGH HMS and after that, she worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the DCRP until obtaining a staff position in September 2012. She holds a BA in psychology from Cornell University and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Virginia. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Nair. Thank you so much for having me. Let me share my slides. Okay. So honored to be here today, gonna talk about hyperthermia and heated yoga for depression. I got into this, I started doing heated yoga in graduate school and I was learning how to be a psychologist and all about therapy, in therapy, giving therapy and started experiencing the benefits of heated yoga, was wishing I could tell my clients about it at the time and there was nothing in the literature about it. Anyhow, came to the DCRP under mentorship, we started exploring this as a treatment avenue got excited about whole body hyperthermia. And so we have these two parallel areas of research going on and I'm gonna talk about them both today. All right, these are my, excuse my cat, mentors, uh, MGH mentors and collaborators and external mentors and collaborators, just to acknowledge them. In terms of disclosures, the only disclosure I have is really that the yoga for all these studies that I'm gonna discuss have been donated. We have funding from, we did complete funding from NIH for the randomized control trial that I'm gonna present today. These are the individuals who started donating the yoga with us. So they owned three studios in the community at the time. And those studios have since changed ownership. The only studio remaining is now in Cambridge owned by Shelly and Pablo, but just to thank them. And also to thank all the participants in the study. Every time I go to these classes, they're very rigorous and I'm always, um, humbled that we've asked people with depression to come and do this intervention because it is not an easy intervention. And that's something that I'm happy to talk more about in the question and answer period. It's a, it's a difficult thing to initiate and to go to. Today, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about the literature on just whole body hyperthermia. So just heat, I'm gonna talk about heat plus yoga, which is heated yoga. I'm gonna present our two studies uh, the open label and a randomized controlled trial, and also just talk about our work that is ongoing on whole body hyperthermia. So we're all, I mean, around the world, people are drawn to heat, you know, whether it's sunbathing, these are geothermal spas in Iceland. This is a Korean tourmaline spa. This is in Canada. This is just a sauna. So what do we know about heat by itself for major depressive disorder? This is a trial in, uh, that was published in JAMA Psychiatry by our colleague that we're working with, Chuck Raison, Charles Chuck Raison. This study was published in 2016. Now, what happened in this study is they took 30 people, well, they randomized 34, but 30 received the intervention to go into this device. And they either went into this device and got the active arm or the sham. The active arm, they brought people up to 38.5, which takes about 100 minutes on average. And then they do a 60 minute cool down where they turn off those chest um, heaters and just leave on the leg coolers. And the temperature actually still goes up a little bit. In the sham condition, they only put the leg heaters on and they actually built a whole box around the um, chest heaters with lamps and uh, fans so that people would be uh, think that they were getting the active treatment. So I think 71.4% of the people in the active condition actually thought they were, I mean, in the sham, thought they were getting the active. So that can help with expectancy effects and placebo effects. So when I show you these results, it's even more impressive because people were really, uh, did mostly believe that they were getting the active condition in both arms. Now you can see they're getting this one treatment at Week zero is the one treatment, which took about two and a half hours. Week one, you can see the effect size is over two, which is huge for psychiatry research. Meta-analyses of antidepressants, the effect size or the magnitude of the impact is basically 0.3 to 0.4. 
or the effect sizes that we see. So these are five times the effect sizes. So just very interest, uh, very exciting um, data here. And you can see that the effects were sustained for up to six weeks with that one treatment. And now one of the issues in this area is nobody's followed anybody after the six weeks. So there is a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of what we can explore. Also, this study was only people off of antidepressants. That's another interesting thing that I'm happy to talk more about in the question and answer period. So then what do we know about whole body hyperthermia or heat plus yoga? And the kind of heat that uh, heated yoga that's in the literature and that we're doing was formerly Bikram yoga. Now it's just called like original hot yoga or hot 26. Um, but it brings people, it's in a room of 105 degrees and that brings people up to temperatures very similar to those in whole body hyperthermia. The sequence is usually very standardized, which lends itself well to clinical trials. It's 26 postures in a standard, you know, um, sequence with the dialogues very standardized. Um, they are playing with time. Uh, so some classes are 60 minutes, some are 75, and some are 90. But when we did these studies, they were all 90 minute classes. That's been a newer, newer thing that the time is starting to be shifted. This is the only known randomized controlled trial on heated yoga for depression. It was not by our group. This group beat us to publishing the results. The results of our RCT are under review right now. This group is a Canadian group. They studied um, heated yoga versus exercise versus a weightless control. The weightless control was outperformed by the aerobic exercise and the heated yoga. You can see their response rates for the heated yoga and aerobic exercise were in the 60% range. So it worked. The yoga was no different than the aerobic exercise, which was interesting. Um, and I'm gonna switch to just showing you our data. So this is our open label study. It was published in 2019, eight weeks. We did the assessments and the intervention was done in the community, which made it very hard. All these studies were difficult to get started because of doing the intervention in the community, which is something, I, if anyone's interested in that, I'm happy to talk more about that. Uh, 28 individuals in our analysis. One of the issues in the yoga literature overall and the people who use yoga, if you look at the studies that kind of tell you about the characteristics of yoga users, they're, they're unfortunately largely female, white, and college educated. And our studies are representing that, that demographic and they're younger. So I think that's something to think about with generalizability, access issues, privilege issues. There's a lot of that that we could think about just in yoga in general. And I think it's, it's panning out, I think in heated yoga too. So the study worked. The clinician rated scale is the gold standard. They did it with blind, well, it wasn't blinded because it was only a open label study, but it worked. The effect sizes were large. They were over one and it was on the self-rated and clinician rated uh, um, interview. And the response rate for those who made it past week three was above 50%, 56% remitters. So that's about what we were seeing in that other study as well. And this is a way that I like, this was not published, but this is a way I like to sometimes show the data. And it's just that the negative domains, so the symptom burden or states of suffering seem to be decreasing and the positive domains seem to be increasing, meaning, you know, vitality, wellness. And again, I think sometimes our treatments in psychiatry focus on just how do we get rid of these depressive symptoms? But then you're sort of thinking to yourself, well, how do you treat, you know, other than positive psychology or, um, you know, things like that, it's like, do we give people a path to wellness? So in this, you know, you're seeing like hopelessness wasn't significant, but it goes down in the right direction. Anxiety, negative affect, impairments in cognitive and physical functioning go down across the board. I just like to think about that as reduced suffering. Like they're all just proxies for people not suffering as much. And then you're seeing, I mean, optimism wasn't significant, but in the right direction, quality of life was significant, self-compassion and positive affect significant, you know, they're increasing. So I, 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 that's something that I think is important that these, that an intervention can give you these positive states of consciousness too. And in terms of our randomized control trial, it was <clears throat> uh, funded. These were my mentors, just to acknowledge them. It was much larger and it was randomized. So there were 65 people in our analyses. And again, younger, white, female, college educated. I, you know, I feel like I should, I, you know, I think this is just an issue across the board. Uh, we, the completion rates were not as high as we wanted them to be. It's a rigorous intervention. People didn't go as much as we wanted them to. We asked for twice a week over eight weeks and we got 10. So we wanted at least 16. 
on average, we did not get it. What's interesting is, is it still worked. And the other study, our open label study, people went to one a week as well, even though we asked for two. So we're seeing at lower doses, it's seeming to work. Um, so here's our primary endpoint right here. The yoga group significantly outperformed the wait list. The yoga group is the red line. The wait list is the blue line. Large, very large effect size over one. Um, it was not one of the things, just to keep in mind, it wasn't an active control group. So that is something to keep in mind. That's the next step that we need to do. Um, and the other group did do it. They compared it to exercise and it did not separate. Our remission and response rates are similar to what we're seeing in other studies. Response rates a lower bar and they're getting almost about 60%, 59% of people responded. These are the secondary outcomes. So our secondary outcomes were anxiety, quality of life and perceived stress. They all went in the right direction. So that's good to see. And I'm gonna transition just talking briefly about our whole body hyperthermia research. Um, this is our MGH team. These are our wonderful research coordinators who are making this whole thing possible. And these are our external collaborators and Chuck Raison, whose study that I was just talking about, the, um, that's him on the right. And all of these individuals have been heavily involved. So Simi Foster is working on our group. She has a K23. We just started enrolling last week after years. And I mean years of trying to get this started due to FDA regulations. The device is considered a significant risk device due to cancer studies that bring people up to 104. So we have to have a monitor and an IDE and it's been very difficult to get started. She's gonna replicate Chuck's randomized control trial with a larger sample. She's gonna include people on antidepressants, which is interesting because that hasn't been done. And she's gonna look at biological mechanisms. So inflammatory signaling and heat response on a cellular level as a mechanism for the antidepressant effect. Here is the email if anybody is interested. I think we actually already have a wait list. I'm gonna knock on wood. We already have like 60 phone screens and we just opened up um, enrollment. So I am crossing my fingers that we actually don't have a problem enrolling because we've had such trouble getting the study launched. So that would be amazing. And to actually just say thank you to OSHER, we are very grateful to be supported by the pilot fund um, for a pilot study of using whole body hyperthermia to look at long COVID. We have reason to think it works. It helps with other fatigue-related illnesses. Uh, we are going to use Ashley Mason at UCSF. There she is. She uses sauna instead of the whole body, the heckle hyperthermia device because it's not as heavily regulated by the FDA. So we are using this sauna device, and we are going to study whole body hyperthermia for long COVID with the same protocol that Chuck used in his randomized control trial. We are going to be using aura rings. I have one on. She has donated us these aura rings that are gonna allow us um, to measure sleep and heart rate and temperature. And we're gonna do inflammatory markers as well. And we are excited to get that started in addition to Simi study. And that is it. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Nair. And now we're gonna be transitioning uh, to the talk of our final speaker on digital innovations. And Dr. Sabine Wilhelm will be talking to us today. Dr. Sabine Wilhelm is a professor at Harvard Medical School and chief of psychology, as well as director of the Center for OCD and Related Disorders at Massachusetts General Hospital. She is also the director of the Center for Digital Mental Health and Psychiatry at MGH. Dr. Wilhelm is recognized as a leading researcher in obsessive compulsive and related disorders. Her recent research focuses on using cutting edge technology to improve and personalize mental health care for a range of mental health outcomes. Dr. Wilhelm has published 318 papers, including seven books, and has given more than 290 lectures on these subjects. She has been a mentor to 50 junior investigators in the field and is currently working on a smartphone-based treatment for OCD, depression, and body dysmorphic disorder. Her ultimate goal is to use technology-based interventions to enhance global access to high-quality mental health interventions. Dr. Wilhelm is the Vice Chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the International OCD Foundation and serves on the Scientific Council for the Anxiety and Depression Association of America and the Tourette Syndrome Association Behavioral Science Consortium. She is the past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, and she was an associate editor for the journals Depression and Anxiety and Behavioral Therapy. She currently serves on eight editorial boards and has been the principal investigator 
or site principal investigator of seven NIMH funded research grants. She is also the principal investigator of several privately funded clinical research studies investigating medication, cognitive behavioral therapy, digital services, and other treatments for a range of psychiatric disorders in children and adults. Thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Lin. Thank you so much for your nice introduction. So I will be talking about digital innovations in mental health, and specifically, I'll be focusing on smartphone-based treatments. But before I do so, I want to show you my disclosures. And probably what's most relevant here is the research grant support that I got from COA Health because they funded several of the studies that I will be discussing today. So. Even before COVID, we were suffering from a mental health crisis and one in five adults and one in seven kids were suffering from mental health issues. And then things got so much worse uh, after COVID started. And a recent report showed that now about 28% of adults are suffering from depression. That's three times higher than pre-COVID. And young adults have been the hardest hit. About 42% of them are currently suffering from moderate depression. So things are much, much worse. Everything has increased. Anxiety has increased. Substance use has increased. Suicidality has been increased and especially young people, kids and adolescents are suffering so much, so much that the Surgeon General actually recently warned us that we are currently in a youth mental health crisis. And even before COVID, most people with mental illness did not receive any care, that was a norm. And of the 40% of, of individuals who did, only about 38% of those received care that was considered to be minimally adequate. And now, of course, because of COVID and the mental health crisis, things are worse than ever before. And, um, you know, why, why do people not get care? And when, when you ask individuals, they will say, well, you know, it's incredibly difficult to, uh, to find a therapist. And, and, and even for us here in Boston, right, where, where we have such a density of mental health service provider, it's extremely challenging to, to find a referral. And frankly, even if we do find one, very often the patient has to wait for a few months before they get in. And if they can find somebody, then they often have to pay several hundred dollars per treatment session, right? And the average person actually can't really afford this, right? And but but frankly, even and if patients could afford it and could get in, patients will often say, look, it's really very difficult for me to fit treatment into uh, my life. Um, and um, because I have to drive to the appointment, one of the previous speakers mentioned parking, I have to park, you know, that's incredibly challenging in Boston, pay for parking, um, take time off work, find childcare. And I mean, there's so many barriers that people experience with regard to initiating or staying in uh, mental health treatments. And then of course, many patients will also say, for me, there is still so much shame and so much stigma associated with the idea of walking into the office of a mental health service provider. So in other words, people have to overcome so many barriers to receive care. And I actually think that's where new technology-based treatments can really help. There are some good results with internet-based treatments. And I really personally like smartphone-based treatments because so many people now have smartphones. Well over 80% of people in the United States own a smartphone. And frankly, the penetration is very high globally, even in emerging economies. And what's really nice about smartphones and I'm sure that's true for most of you. I bet that for most of you, your phone is somewhere very close to where you are right now. So with your phones, we can typically reach you any time of the day, wherever you are. So you wouldn't have to wait. If you wanted to initiate a phone-based treatment, you wouldn't have to wait for your clinician uh, to be ready. And you could just basically download an app and from, from the app store and get going right then and there. And obviously you don't have to drive to the appointment or fight childcare because you do the treatment from wherever you are. And I think importantly, I think the barrier to initiate this kind of a treatment from a shame and stigma perspective is much lower because most of us are so used to running our lives with our phones, right? I mean, we use 
maps to get to wherever we need to go and Venmo to send money around. And many of you probably have health apps on your phones where you track your, track your steps or track your sleep. So that step up to maybe download a mental health treatment app might not be as high. And of course, these phone-based treatments are so much less expensive than a face-to-face -face treatment would be. And the quality of these treatments is actually quite high. There are really good results now with smartphone apps for depression, anxiety, quality of life. But we do know that those treatments work better when there is a little bit of human contact. So if, if you have like a coach or a therapist in the background and that person in the background doesn't have to do much. I mean, we have found in our own work that that person really actually only has to interact with the patient for about 90 seconds a week or so. So it's a very limited interaction, but patients seem to care that there's somebody else that they are accountable to who sends them a little message who says, well, you know, you haven't logged into your app for a few days. How about you come back now? A good job when the patient has accomplished something. So that does seem to make a difference when there is a bit of a guide. So I think there's a lot of excitement in this fast moving field right now, but we have to be careful. Right now, there are 20,000 apps in the app store. So there are many, many apps to choose from. But only about two to four percent of those apps, depending on which disorder you're looking at, have an evidence base. That's kind of scary, right? Because in essence, these apps say they're an intervention, they're a treatment. Two to four percent have an evidence base. Um, also, of course, the apps have to be safe for people to use, not only clinically, but also from a privacy perspective. And that's often not guaranteed at all. So for example, you're downloading an app and you think, oh great, this app is free. And then it's actually not free because in essence, you are paying for this app by handing over your personal data, right? And the app developer is using your data and selling them to uh, third parties. So privacy is an issue. And then um, engagement is also an issue in many apps. So very often patients will download an app and then they never come back to it because they will say, well, this was really clunky to use. It wasn't fun and engaging. But fortunately, there are no ways that can help you to maybe find some tools that you would like. So if you're a patient or if you're a clinician, I encourage you to check out some of these websites here. So One Mind Cyber Guide, for instance, is a website where you can, and I should say I'm on their scientific advisory board, but it's all donor funded. But anyway, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a website where you can just type in, for instance, I'm looking for an anxiety app, let's say, and then it will give you a number of tools and it will tell you how well they are doing with regard to their evidence and you know their privacy policy and engagement and the other website here websites here I like them as well like Mind Tools and Orca and the app rating system from the American Psychiatric Association is quite nice as well. People sometimes ask me what about the FDA? Is the FDA involved? And the FDA is really just starting to get involved in um, in regulating this field. I mean, it's a very difficult field to regulate. Um, and um, uh, FDA is still very much in the early stages and typically they don't regulate psychotherapies anyway, but we have to kind of have to see where that goes with time. And Dr. Casano already mentioned our Center for Digital Mental Health earlier. So thank you for that shout out. So yeah, so just very recently, we founded a Center for Digital Mental Health at Mass General, where we are developing and testing new digital tools to prevent a mental illness, to assess it and treat it. We are very eager to also implement our tools in real life. And we are very eager to find collaborators. We always work with our patients when we make apps. We work with obviously designers and engineers and clinicians and researchers and even people from the healthcare system. But I think that's how we make better tools if we have many stakeholders who are engaged right from the beginning. I just want to tell you about an app we just recently completed and tested in a clinical trial. So this is an app for 
body dysmorphic disorder. So body dysmorphic disorder is a preoccupation with a perceived flaw in appearance. So in, otherwise, uh, in other words, these patients look absolutely fine, but they're really worried about the way they look. And they often think about their appearance for many hours a day. So it's a severe body image disorder and patients engage in all kinds of rituals in order to hide their perceived uh, appearance flaws or they fix them with uh, plastic surgery, for instance, or they look in the mirror again and again. So they have many rituals, engage in a lot of uh, avoidance behaviors. And we treated those patients with um, an app-based treatment that was supported by a bachelor's level coach. We interacted with them for um, like a minute and a half a week. And um, here you can actually see some screenshots of the app. You can see that, you know, the, the, there are some tools where, where patients are setting goals. So there's a mindfulness tool right here. Here you can see the um, chat feature that we had in the app where the patients were able to interact within the app with their therapist or coach. And here on the right, you can see that we also were very concerned about patient safety. So we assessed that as well. And we had developed that app in collaboration with designers, engineers, but also our patients. And then we tested the app in new patients who had never undergone face-to-face -face cognitive behavior therapy before. As you can see here, the results were really quite good. About 70% of the patients responded to the treatment, meaning that their symptoms dropped by at least 30%. And 50% of the patients were clinically remitted, no longer um, clinically ill after 12 weeks only. So that was very exciting and inspired us then to make an app for obsessive compulsive disorder. So if, any, if anybody in the audience has uh, OCD, please don't hesitate to reach out. Or if you have patients with OCD, the link is down here where you can um, um, see how you can enroll in a clinical trial. But anyway, that OCD app is currently in clinical trial and we're looking for people who want to work with us. And we also just recently uh, started a clinical trial for our depression app. So here patients can participate in app-based treatment, but they also get to see via Zoom a clinical psychologist for short sessions. That trial is currently underway and patients seem to really enjoy it. But anyway, I'm going to stop right here. And I just want to say, you know, we are right now in the middle of a major mental health crisis and most people are not getting any care at all. Most people are just out there suffering because they can't get access to care. But I really think that technology can provide us with solutions because technology is already infiltrating every aspect of our life anyway. But with technology, I think we can offer scalable solutions to our patients for treatment. And as you saw today, the results are really quite good. So if we all work together, we work together with our patients and clinicians and other stakeholders, we, we, can, we can help here. We can work by minimizing the risks and really maximizing the benefits for our patients. So anyway, I'm out of time, but I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions in the Q&A session. So thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Dr. Wilhelm. So now we're gonna transition uh, to having some questions uh, from our audience, and I'm gonna invite all of our panelists here to answer. Um, you know, Dr. Wilhelm and Dr. Nyer, you actually gave us um, a great preview of how people can actually participate in your studies. But I just want to ask Dr. King, Dr. Siddiqui, Dr. Kasano, can you tell our audience members about some of your um, ongoing trials and how people might either be able to participate themselves or how they might be able to recommend this to patients? How can they learn more about your existing trials. Let's start with Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, yeah, so in terms of, of uh, 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 actual clinical trials that patients can participate in, the one that we have, uh, uh, we have one ongoing right now for active patients. So it's, uh, it's meant for people who have both depression and anxiety and they fail at least one antidepressant medication. Uh, we've derived some uh, circuit-based treatment targets that we believe to be differentially effective for depression and anxiety. And we've known, we believe for a long time that TMS works for both. We were trying to see if we can be more precise. So, uh, so there's not a lot of TMS trials out there anymore because we already know the TMS works. So there's not a need to do more trials. But this trial is, is taking people with depression and anxiety 
and randomizing them to a target that's maybe a little better for depression versus maybe a little better for anxiety. So one of the things that I love about this trial is that everybody gets active treatment, nobody gets sham. So if you have some, anybody with, or, or if you are suffering from uh, major depression and anxiety, or if you have a patient uh, that, and have tried at least one medication, and either it was, uh, couldn't tolerate it, had side effects, uh, didn't work, any of those reasons, uh, you're welcome to find it. You, you can find it on our website or, or just Google my name, you'll see it pretty easily. Um, we're also running trials for people for healthy controls to learn more about this, the, uh, the behaviors and, uh, uh, and analyzing data to learn more about the circuits. But those are, uh, but if we're talking about specifically things that patients would be eligible for, that's it for now. We're probably going to launch another one soon where we try the new accelerated five day protocol uh, and, and, uh, and people with major depression, but that one's not uh, running yet. And Dr. Cassano, tell us a little bit about how people can participate in a photobiomodulation trial. Yes, so if, you've, um, if you remember my presentation and the, the different uh, um, doses that we tested on cerebral blood flow, so the medium dose that was the winner uh, will be tested in a double-blind randomized trial. So there would be kind of 50-50 chance to get uh, either sham or the light. Um, it's an eight-week trial at Mass General. It's it, uh, conducted at uh, Charlestown Navy Yard. Um, so as I said, for depression. And so people who do not improve from uh, that treatment uh, can go into an open label and, uh, and receive treatment as part of the open label. Um, so it's very promising. It's the two sites. You can participate here at MGH or in New York. Um, you can Google my name uh, or um, you know, reach out uh, directly to our group uh, on neuromodulation at Mass General. And Dr. Kang, tell us a little bit about your trial. Yeah, so so my actual direct involvement uh, in my studies are really just beginning to get going um, in terms of, you know, we haven't even started. And I'm, I'm working on a couple of studies, particularly with psychosomatic disorders, so irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia. The study, I think, that you referenced in the blurb that um, is a study being run by the associate director of our center, Sharman Ghaznavi. She's the principal investigator. And uh, her study is looking at treatment-resistant depression. And, and she's conducting what will actually be the very, well, is the very first study involving psychedelics ever done at Mass General or ever done actually at a, a Harvard hospital. Um, if you look, if you go to the Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics webpage, there is uh, a section called current research and you can contact the research coordinators it is currently enrolling so uh, people have to meet criteria for treatment resistant depression um and, and and it is enrolling right now so you can look into that and most likely in coming years there will be many more but just you know this psychedelic treatments just for those in the audience i think it's important to to note here, you know, all of these psychedelics right now are Schedule One substances, which means, according to the federal government, there's no recognized medical use. They're illegal, and getting a study done takes a huge amount of regulatory work um, to get going. So, you know, when we sort of start, it usually takes a few years before they they reach fruition. But check out the website Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics, and and you can learn more about current studies. Thank you for that. And, you know, since we have such an abundance of expertise in this room together, I'm going to ask you, Dr. Wilhelm and Dr. Siddiqui, if we were to combine cognitive behavioral therapy um, with TMS through a mobile app, what, what do you think that would look like? What would you picture being particularly useful for patients? Yeah, I think there are a lot of ways to think about this. With TMS, we believe that we're activating some cognitive control type circuits, which was, should, in theory, help uh, patients be more engaged with CBT. Uh, and th there's a, there are a few things that we still need to work out. Should you give the CBT before the TMS, the TMS before the CBT, flank them with each other? So we need to still work out those parameters. And one of the, uh, there are a few studies that have, been, that have started doing it and found there may be some additive effect. Uh, but we well, we still need to optimize it. Another thing we often notice with TMS is that people go back to their CBT materials that they've uh, that they received a while ago. They look back at it mm -hmm. again and they say, "Oh, it makes sense now. Now I understand mm -hmm. it." Uh, oh, and, and I, I, I couldn't process the stuff before. It was it was nonsense to me. How am I supposed to change my my way of thinking? Uh, mm -hmm. And so it, it seems like uh, people who initially responded to TMS 
CBT might be a good way to sort of maintain their response because now all of a sudden there's something that's working for them that didn't previously work. Mm -hmm. Or it might even accelerate treatment response, right? If the two treatments are combined. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's the goal of well, if mm -hmm. we can figure out how to combine it. One of the challenges mm -hmm. with the studies has been that, you know, again, we don't know the right time, the right dose, mm -hmm. the right interval and all these sorts of things. So what ends up happening is a study comes out saying we did TMS plus CBT or TMS plus uh, uh, app-guided CBT or, or bibliotherapy book-guided CBT. Uh, and the results are often disappointing. And, and I think the reason is because... Uh, uh, they haven't actually tested out those parameters. Which one should be done first? How should they be combined exactly? Uh, I think there's still a lot of potential to improve on the literature that we have right now. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Um, Dr. King, what are some of the barriers to more widespread use of psychedelics for treatment-resistant depression right now? You, you alluded to, you know, regulatory barriers. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's there's really pretty pretty huge barriers. I mean, I think one is is regulatory. So just even to do the research to show, to demonstrate efficacy takes a massive amount of work, uh, both mm -hmm. sort of applying through like multiple different federal bureaucracies, regulatory agencies, I and, uh, IRBs are really kind of scared of this still. There's also working against a lot of, you know, many decades of stigma, most of which is is actually based in, in propaganda. And yet at the same time, you know, there are, I think, a risk of sort of the government's response was was so extreme to psychedelics and psychedelic research in the 60s that a lot of people now are sort of skeptical of, of any risk whatsoever. And there certainly are real risks to psychedelics, especially for certain people who shouldn't take them, which I alluded to. Um, so I, I, I think in terms of more widespread use, I, the, I think the government could do things, and, and there is some talk in Congress of kind of accelerating uh, some of the regulatory processes so we can actually you know, expand the studies more quickly. And then I, I think, again, just these are treatments, the style of which is really fairly anathema to the way that most physicians practice in 2022, which is you know, in medical school, you learn to sort of, you know, interpret patient data and make a prescription. And really sort of the, the core ethos underlying psychedelic therapy is something that is much more akin to something like mindfulness or meditation. It's a practice that's teaching people to be open. The therapist is there to support the patient, but not really to do anything to the patient. So it's not a sort of prescriptive or reactive role. So I think sort of, there's also a huge issue sort of training people to kind of convert to a different way of working with patients, which is going to be a challenge too, in terms of getting therapists who are adequately trained to provide this once we get FDA approval. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, we have a question from an audience member. How do all of you envision that your modality uh, of treatment would help to reduce the stigma of people suffering from depression? Let's start with Dr. Nair. Well, so how does it reduce the stigma for people? One, I think, I will say that when I was running the study of heated yoga for depression, I was going to the yoga studios and all of a sudden, this was like my little sacred temple and the people that I was screening were ending up in class with me. And the classes, you don't wear a lot of clothing, you're sweating, and there is like no difference between anyone in the, like I, you, there's no hierarchy, there's no clothing, there's no, you have nothing on your person and you're all doing the same sequence. There's no phone, nobody's more important or less important. So it's a very um, humanizing experience and it's community-based so anyone can go. And I think half the people in the room are in there for some sort of quote unquote mental health condition you know, whether it's anxiety, whether it's stress, you know, I, I would bet you if you ask people why they're using it, most people are using it to treat some sort of quote unquote mental health condition. Um, so I think it's like a great equalizer in some ways. Mm -hmm. So and there's I a group give aspect. That example. I give a group that aspect. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. What do you think about this, Dr. Cassano? Uh, I, I love it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I can see uh, much of the same for, for photobiomodulation because uh, it's a treatment that, first of all, uh, it's natural in its essence, the use of light. Um, so kind of a little different from uh, uh, the medication that is oftentimes synthetic. Um, and um, 
Also, the fact that you can bring this treatment out of the office at home and you can embed it in, uh, um, in ways that are non-intrusive. Some of these uh, devices can be actual textile, electronic textile. Uh, so they might be personalized. So they might become objects like hats uh, that you wear, that you like, you enjoy. Uh, so it, you kind of come from a different shape uh, and context, uh, which uh, really can uh, remove stigma. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Siddiqui, you, know, you made a point to note that PMS is not ECT light. You have a lot of patients who, who think to themselves, you know, um, this is this is a procedure, this is an intervention, I'm worried about this, I'm, I'm less likely to do this. Can you comment for us on any element of stigma there? Yeah, I think uh, it's there's two ends of the spectrum. There's uh, people who feel stigmatized for the fact they have to come in and get a procedural treatment. And again, they, 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 they want to know, is this like ECT? And it's usually pretty easy to, uh, to address that with the science. People are usually pretty receptive when I tell them that, okay, these are two totally different things, uh, and here's what the difference is. Uh, if anything, I find it's more the opposite. I think TMS tends to be destigmatizing to people uh, because they feel like this is a medical problem that I'm experiencing. I'm getting a medical treatment for this. It looks like a medical treatment, right? And, uh, uh, and it's a neuroscience-driven medical treatment. I can tell them that we've done brain mapping and shown that this is a, this is a real thing. Uh, and and, and I, I, think, I think telling people, I mean, we all know that mental illness is a real thing, but I think telling people that you know, science agrees with you. Uh, our, our, our treatments, yeah. agree with you. our treatments are driven by the science, and they agree. Like that, that, that I think if anything is destigmatizing, sort of inherently as a result of it, which is one of the reasons why I do it. I think uh, I've all, one of the reasons why I've always studied uh, circuit-based models of mental illness is because I think it really helps destigmatize. It helps prove to uh, to any skeptics that this is there's really no doubt that this is a real thing. And Dr. Wilhelm, you made a point to note that you know. C CBT through um, apps really is destigmatizing, right? Because you don't have to go in for the treatment. You're at home, you're in the privacy of your home. At the same time, more and more people, right? Like most people are aware of the privacy issues and concerns and the possibility mm -hmm. that companies and the internet are, are stalking them. What do you put those two thoughts together? Tell us a little bit about that and the stigma that maybe, maybe people are feeling related to sharing the personal information. Mm -hmm. I mean, so first of all, with, um, with regard to your questions regarding stigma, I, I really think that's where a smartphone based apps can be so incredibly helpful because I think these kind of treatments fit very well in the fabric of our lives, right? I mean, we are so used to using our phone pretty much for, for everything right now, right? I mean, to uh, give the example earlier of sending money around, finding directions, all of that. And, and, and I think it's, if, and it would be so easy for people. It doesn't, it's, it's not as hard as driving to the Department of Psychiatry at MGH, but it was so easy to just download an app and um, get access to treatment that way. And, um, and actually, I think we can also reach different populations uh, that way, right? I mean, um, um, pe people who have traditionally suffered the worst mental health outcomes, such as uh, people who are living in uh, more rural com um, uh, communities, um, um, the Latinx and the African American uh, population, they they typically have the worst health outcomes and the worst mental health outcomes, and we know that they are much more likely to use digital tools tools to access care than to walk to, uh, to, to go to a therapist, to walk into an office. So I think we can reach other population, we can reach them uh, more easily. And then with regard to the privacy issues, I do think that's something that we need to be a little bit careful about. Um, but that's why I showed you those different websites, right? I think it's very important that you don't just kind of run with any tool, but that you educate yourself a little bit mm -hmm. uh, with regard to what, what that tool is like, is there evidence behind it, um, is your privacy uh, protected, and also is it fun to use, you know, because you don't want to get bored with it and drop out after the first attempt. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. For all the panelists, we have a question about how you combat the misinformation that surrounds your modality. Dr. 
Dr. Kang, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I, I think even up to at some point during the pandemic, the, the fear was more the misinformation of kind of the anti-psychedelic camps and the sort of holdover. You have a lot of conservatism, obviously, in medicine that, that really kind of drank the, the Kool-Aid of, of the DEA propaganda and stuff, which held back research that really was you know, achieving incredible results in, in the late 1960s and had nothing to do with the, the counterculture movement or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so there was sort of a, 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 a real concern that, you know, like one sort of adverse outcome would get blown out of proportion, sink the whole research area. I, I actually, I have much more fear on the other side of the equation now. I, I feel like, you know, you can't open a major newspaper or media outlet without hearing about psychedelics almost daily at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a huge amount of potential for what psychedelics can do, but I, I think the way that they work is so unique and different. It's really, it's a really fine nuance way of trying to, to teach people that this is what they do and they are not panaceas. And I, I think there's a huge amount of risk for people to get themselves in trouble thinking that, you know, you can just take some psilocybin and sort of cure depression without all of the sort of hard work that actually goes into on the, on the patient's part in, in these protocols, sort of working with the medicine and, and the work that they do. So, you know, I, I think the, the, it's just incumbent, like it always is with us as a medical profession to just give the information, to try to get the information out there um, and, and really to try to, to thread the needle on the nuanced points. But I, I am, I am really, I'm worried about the hype. I think the hype can, the hype combined, particularly with the mental health crisis that we are in the midst of and have been for so long really might drive people into getting themselves in trouble. So I would caution people on the decisions they make on that. Yeah, no, it's true. And the media in particular recently, right, have been all the startups in this space and providing people uh, ketamine treatments for mental health. There's, as you pointed out, you know, the media is really taking up this issue. Uh, Dr. Nair and Dr. Cassano, what are your thoughts about this? Tell us a little bit more about some of the misinformation that people can have about your respective modalities and, and what you do personally to try to combat that. I can say quickly. So when I first started studying heated yoga, there were two case reports in the literature in PubMed. One was about a psychotic induced episode of heated yoga, and the other was about a seizure induced by overhydration. And I think people are very scared about heated yoga for pregnant women. I think a lot of my mentors, and I, rightfully so, they'll remind me how challenging it is and sort of that it's not safe for everybody. And we have tons of exclusionary criteria and you have to be careful about hydration and you know, our stimulants safe and people shouldn't have heart conditions. It's really rigorous what we're asking people to do. That being said, I don't think there's a whole lot of literature. There's no research really on who, you know, so people will say to me, like, what kind of yoga should I do? And I'm like, we've never compared to heated to non-heated yoga. Mm -hmm. So we, we mm -hmm. meet, like, I might like heated yoga. I sort of think heated, like, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. So I think, I just think there's not, we need studies comparing the two. And since there's not a lot of studies of it, it's like on some part of me wants to be like, oh gosh, like be safe. Like it's intense in there, you know, make sure you have your doctor's approval. And then the other part of me is like, well, people are doing it all over the world and they're okay mm -hmm. for the most part, you know? So I don't know. I, I just think, cause it's so new. I'm a little bit like, I don't know. I think people need to listen to their own bodies and make sure that they do talk to their doctor and think about any challenges. But that being said, like the first three classes, you go through this, um, like acclimatizing to the heated environment. So it feels really challenging. And Chuck Raison, who we work with, talks about this adaptive stressor model where he believes that like anything that really sort of these interventions and sort of much like psychedelics, there's an, there, there's like an acute stressor that you go through that then causes these antidepressant effects, but they're intense. So sort of like the more intense it is, maybe the greater the antidepressant effect, but then you're putting your body into this intense experience. So yeah. I think that's kind of for that. So sorry to cut everybody off. We're actually at the end of this session. Um, we're going to have a 10 minute break and then we'll have a um, session on connecting to social and natural ecosystems. I invite everybody to join us there. Thank you to all of our experts today. Really enjoyed those talks. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.